Right, now joining us in the studio is Sir Steve Webb, of course, former minister in the Coalition Government and Member of Parliament. So Steve, thank you very much for joining us today. First okay. things first, how are you? Uh, yeah, not so bad. It's nice to be here. My, my son's studying at Warwick University, oh, so right. I, I couldn't say no. <laughs> and what, what year is your son in then? Uh, he's in second year studying history. Oh, fantastic. Um, so, first things first, Steve, obviously you were Member of Parliament uh, for, for quite a number of years. Uh, you lost your seat in 2015, where quite a lot of uh, Lib Dems did so. Do you think the Lib Dems are doing enough since then to kind of get back their, their national attention, as it were? It was always a challenge in the run-up to the years of government to get attention for a third party. Mm. So in the run-up to 2010, when we were clearly the third party, at least south of the border, even then, you know, you, you, I was a Lib Dem opposition spokesperson on health or pensions or whatever, and any journalist would be, why do I want to run this story? You're never going to be in power. Why do I care? That's when you're a third party, which, as it turns out, was about to be in government. Mm. Now you've suddenly got a multi-party system. You've got the SNP. You've got UKIP's rise and fall. You've got the Greens and so on. So getting attention is even more difficult for the Dems. Not say they shouldn't try. Not say they can do better. But um, it, often, you know, you you look at the news agenda for the day and you've got several stories about the government because you've got different factions in the government, you've got different factions in the opposition, the SNP are a bigger group in Westminster than the Lib Dem. So these sound like excuses, they're just facts. Mm. The reality of the media is trying to... So, so therefore, you know, a Lib Dem policy announcement nobody cares about. So you have to you have to hammer away at themes, specialise in themes. So, for example, Norman Lamb, Lib Dem MP, has done a lot on mental health. So you'll see Norman Lamb on the main BBC News because he's recognised on mental health. Yeah. And that's really the way people sort of remember the party exists because often on the ground in a lot of the country, there's quite a strong membership now, but there isn't a huge amount of elected activity. Going back to the coalition now, obviously it's, it's regarded as perhaps one of the most controversial political uh, moments that's happened uh, this century. But would you regret going into coalition? Because, of course, from a personal level, you lost your seat, but then you did get to work in the Department of Pensions and, and obviously change things rather than speaking about them. Do you regret it at all? I don't. Um, I mean, in 2010, there's a choice. You know, we I think the last Liberals had been in government 70 years earlier or something, and someone said to us in 2010, oh, no, we, we shouldn't go into coalition because we could be, you know, out of power for 70 years or something. And it's like, we, you know, what's the point <laughs> of standing for election if you get the chance to actually implement not everything that you wanted to do, but some of it, and you walk away because you'll compromise your purity? You know, we lost the 2010 election. We got 57 MPs. That was great. The Tories got 300. Labour got 250. We lost that election. So you then get the chance to actually shape a programme for government. And what was interesting was... Whereas the Labour Party had been in office for 13 years and wasn't mentally in a place where it wanted to share power, you know, for all sorts of reasons, personalities amongst others, the Conservatives were desperate to get back into power and were actually willing to share quite a lot. And so when David Cameron in the morning after the election said, look, I've looked at the big four things on the front of your manifesto, you know, taking people out of tax, we can do that. Uh, you know, pupil premium, fair funding for schools, we can do that. We won't give you electoral reform, but we'll do AV. You know, we don't agree with you on Europe, but, you know, we can do stuff on sustainable energy. You know, there, there was enough that we've been fighting for, campaigning for, to actually think, yes, we make a difference. Mm. And of course, you know, the junior coalition partners across Europe suffer. We know that. We knew that in 2010. You know, things go well, the winners get the credit, things go badly, oh, why did you, you know, why did you prop up them? So, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't an easy win to be had there. Yeah. But, but I look back now on those five years, and I am struck how many people say to me today, particularly given what's happened since... I want a bad period. You know, we actually given two. It was two years after the financial crash. Things were pretty. You know, when we were negotiating the coalition deal, the stock markets were in turmoil. There was, you know, what's going to happen on the Monday after the election, and actually having a stable program for government for five years. That, and I can use the word stable now, you know, which was stable for five years, particularly compared with what's happened since. You know, I'm not ashamed of that. Now, of course, you mentioned pupil premium there, which was one of the things the Lib Dems are most proud of, the triple lock on pensions, which, of course, you were responsible for. But a lot of critics, and it's probably easy to say in hindsight, will say that the Lib Dems should have demanded a lot more. So, for instance, electoral reform is, is the big thing for the Lib Dems, and they've got a referendum on AV, but it was, it was a bit light compared to what could have... I mean, do you think they should have gone in and said, well, you know, we can really make this government work, we're going to demand a lot more? appreciate it's easy in hindsight, but do you think you, there was a bit more room for manoeuvre there? Um... Possibly a bit more in the sense that we, we gradually learned during the coalition years we had a bit more leverage than we thought. Mm. 
But would we have got a deal on day one for PR? We wouldn't, because the Tories wouldn't have, wouldn't have signed up for it. And the Tories always had a card in their back pocket, which was to run as a minority government. And, you know, they weren't that many short of a majority. They could have, they were the only party with any money to fight another snap election. And we'd all got 1974 in our minds, you know, February election inconclusive, another one in October. And they could have called another election in the autumn and said, look, we've just been through an economic crisis. We've got economic political instability. You've got a straight choice between the blues and the reds. You know, vote for anyone else and you just get, you know, and they could have targeted all their activity on 15 marginal Lib Dem Tory seats, you know, and they could have had a majority for five years, mm. instead of which we got to shape five years, you know. Okay. Uh, you obviously work quite closely with Ian Duncan Smith uh, in your role as, as Minister for Pensions. He's someone who comes under a lot of criticism. But I just want to know from a personal point of view, he's seen as this kind of villainous creature, but <laughs> do you think he, because he said he wanted to create the biggest kind of change to, to benefits and uh, that there that be the Department of Work and Pensions, do you think he was, he was a kind of an honest person or, or do you think he does deserve a lot of the criticism he gets? Well, we certainly don't agree on Europe, as right. you might imagine. <laughs> yes. um, but I think the thing about that point in, in the cycle was that whoever had taken over at the DWP was going to be trying to spend less on welfare, benefits, social security. Um, Labour, Tory, whoever would have been trying to, you know, simply because you've got a deficit of £150 billion pounds a year and social security is by far the biggest area of government spending. So had I found myself alongside a Conservative Secretary of State whose sole agenda was cuts, I'd have been gone in six months. Yeah. The difference, I think, with Ian Duncan Smith is you have to remember the sequence of events. So he was Conservative leader, turfed out by his own party. He could, like many have done, gone off to the city. Mm -hmm. He could have got some boards, some non-executive directorships, made a nice amount of money for doing nothing, just being a name on a letterhead, and he didn't do that. So he sets up a think tank, the Centre for Social Justice, he goes to Glasgow, looks at the estates, thinks that there are problems of poverty that need tackling, sets up a think tank to try and tackle these things, and then becomes a Secretary of State who has a reforming vision alongside the cuts. Now, because the cuts are difficult, uncomfortable, nobody likes voting for that. But alongside that, there was this positive vision, merge the benefits into one, make it pay to work, all that kind of stuff. And that kind of almost kept you going through the dark days. You know, the fact there was this positive reforming vision, and of course, George Osborne then comes along and takes money out of it so that, it, you know, even the reform looks mean. But, you know, in the context, I think that was as good as it was going to get, really. Now, of course, in the uh, coalition, the triple lock, I've, I've mentioned it before, that was, you know, arguably your big thing that you wanted to implement. Theresa May pledged to scrap it uh, in the manifesto that didn't go so well at the last election. Um, you come under quite a lot of criticism from, from certain people about your reforms to pensions, and I know there's, there's certain people who um, welcome the reforms you made. Um, I mean, do you think anyone in your position would have had a pretty tough time making those reforms? And or did you kind of go through with all of the reforms that you intended to? I, I, I couldn't have dreamt, I mean, A, I couldn't have dreamt of surviving for five years, because mm. the, the typical pensions minister lasted about 18 months, if they were oh, really? lucky. So to actually just survive, you know, I'm always introduced now as the longest serving ever, <laughs> so, you know, but surviving's not, not enough, but it means you can see reforms through. So, you know, we now have a new state pension system, riveting, I know, if you're in your early 20s, but, you know, it, it is a heck of a lot simpler. So for people at university now, all the complexity has gone. If they put 35 years in the system, they'll get a flat pension at 8,000 a year at the moment. And if you don't want to retire at 8,000 a year, you need something else. So it's, it's much simpler. I think it's fairer to many women who are getting a poor deal. We've got automatic enrolment, so when you start a, a paid job, your employer will put you in a pension. They'll have a legal duty to put some money in. You'll put some money in. You're free to opt out. But people in their 20s overwhelmingly are not opting out. Mm. And so they will then have a pension with their name on it, pot of money, a simple state pension, and then when they get older, they'll have much more choice about what to do, the so-called freedom and choice stuff, where I talked about people buying a Lamborghini with their pension, all that kind of stuff. So those three things together I'm really very proud of. Now, however, we had to do the tough stuff. We had to do stuff about the age at which people can draw a pension. You know, we're all living massively longer, and yet men's pension age hasn't gone up in a century. So we had to equalise men and women quicker, which was tough on some older women. And, you know, so there was mm. tough stuff we had to do. But the chance to do these reforms, and because Ian Duncan Smith was so focused on the working age stuff, I had a pretty free hand on the pension stuff, which for someone who wasn't in the cabinet, so I was a mid-ranking Minister of State, to drive through a whole series of reforms that I believed in and am proud of was fantastic. On Europe, you mentioned obviously yourself and Ian Duncan Smith disagreed <laughs> on that, but do you think the Lib Dems, what, uh, whilst they're seen as being obviously the, the only party really that seems to be pro-European, they're, they're often becoming more disruptive 
than constructive on the EU. Would you would you tend to agree with that? I'm not sure about that. I mean, it, it, you've got this bizarre paradox. So you've got a Conservative leader who voted Remain taking us out. You've got a Labour leader who may or may not have voted <laughs> Brexit sort of trying to oppose what's going on and trying to find a space in that... Was you know because there's the two parts of the party name and there's the Democrats bit mm. so it's really very uncomfortable to say we think the public were wrong but then every election you say actually we'd like you to vote differently to the way you voted last time so I think it's legitimate to say well we we were in the minority um, you voted for this let's give you the chance to sign off on the final deal I think mm. seems to be a reasonable place to be um, but again just trying you know because the the media are so interested in divisions within the government and within the main opposition party just hearing. You know, if you've got quite a subtle position on this, it's very hard to be heard. A couple more questions, if I may, Steve. Um, yeah. Your talk tonight is, of course, how to become a minister. Now, <laughs> uh, I doubt uh, anyone will leave the room tonight, obviously, becoming a minister straight away. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of hard work. Um, just generally, for people who can't kind of attend the talk tonight, what would you say are your main tips for, for kind of where you are today? Not just as a minister, but obviously, you know, being an MP and the longest serving pension well, minister. Well, yeah, I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> um, it's partly being in the right place at the right time, to be honest. So, I mean, you know, I, I got elected to Parliament in 1997 on the crest of a wave, in that case, of sort of anti-conservative sentiment. So if it hadn't been 97 when I stood on, a, you know, I overturned a conservative majority of over 11,000 votes. I was fighting a constituency that had the badminton horse trials, the Beaufort Hunt and Chipping Sobbery. You know, it wasn't prime territory <laughs> but I was in the right place at the right time which got me into parliament and again in 2010 you know I didn't go into the 2010 election thinking I'd come out of it a minister but the electoral arithmetic you know so I think if you're in one of the larger parties the Conservatives and Labour Party tend to think at some point they will be in government mm. and I suppose I if I had advice for someone in one of those parties presumed to have advice it would be don't be a toady in lickspittle <laughs> you know yeah, fine. If you're a serial rebel, if you're Jeremy Corbyn, ironically, you know, if you always vote against your own party and people get really irritated, you probably won't be a minister. But actually, you won't necessarily be a minister just by, you know, the whips hand out a question, a prime minister's questions, and you ask the prime minister if she agrees what a wonderful record she's got, and she says yes, and that doesn't get you to be a minister either. Actually, a bit of backbone, a bit of, you know, um, specialism helps. So in Parliament, you arrive on day one in Parliament, you've, you're a big fish in a small pond from your local area. You know, people know who you are, you're in the papers, people recognise you in the street and the high street. You arrive at Westminster and discover nobody cares. Oh, really? Because you're one of 650, they don't know your name, you know, the people on the door are sort of checking your face against the list. Nobody knows who you are, nobody is sitting waiting to hear what you've got to say. So what MPs tend to do is find a niche. So it can be a subject, which was my kind of approach, sort of pensions and benefits and stuff. It can be, some are just passionate about their area. I have a former MP friend, Bob Russell, who used to call himself the voice of Colchester. And all he ever did was talk about Colchester. And, you know, it's a lovely place. But, you know, and that's his thing. So if he got a question of the Prime Minister, it wouldn't be about global peace or, you know, renewable energy. It would be about Colchester. Yeah. And that's a niche. And, you know, that you need people to do that. You get people who are um, quite kind of cross-party about the way they do things, so they'll join cross-party groups to get something done on human trafficking or something like that. So there's lots of ways to make a difference and to stand out rather than just being a kind of tedious loyalist, which actually even your own side don't really respect very much. Okay, but also a question, Steve. Uh, going back from that kind of high being a minister to obviously losing your seat, uh, two things on that. Firstly, how kind of difficult was it after serving, I know your constituency actually changed midway through, but kind of serving that area since 97 to, to you know, losing your seat. And also, was there a temptation in 2017 to think, because I think you only lost by, it was, it was certainly under 1,500. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 1, was there a temptation to run again in 2017? <laughs> um, it was pretty tough in 2015 because I, I was pretty clear I wouldn't be a minister anymore after the election, but I thought I would on balance, you know, I was sure we would lose seats, but I thought, you know, you convince yourself, you know, this strong local trans mm. record, you know, I'll somehow withstand the tide, and when you realise that every single Lib Dem in the South West lost, you kind of think that was a big tide. So yeah. like, but, you know, um, I mean, you know, for example, my kids are, you know, late teens, early twenties, 
the previous four elections that I won, we never took them to the election count because they were too, oh, really? too young, because he's at one o'clock in the morning or something. And this one, we thought, right, we'll take the kids along, you know, they can see the dad, you know, win. And there it was, five o'clock in the morning, you know, having to grin and bear it yeah. as I lost. So that, yeah, that's tough. And you, you feel for the people that you employed, because as an MP, you're employing people in your constituency, people in the local party, and they're made redundant, basically overnight. So that's pretty tough. Um, you feel for the people who've campaigned and all of that. So that, you know, that is tough. And you lose a bit of your identity, especially when you've been an MP for 18 years. Because, you know, for that time, you walk into a shop, people know you, they come and talk to you as their MP, they say, oh, I emailed you about something, you know, and suddenly you're not. And you open the local paper the next week, and the new person mm. is standing next to the same people, being photographed doing the same things, and you go, how dare they, you know, that's my <laughs> job, you know. So it's, it is tough on a personal level, and I think, fortunately, I had a profession. You know, I had a subject, so, you know, the following week I was talking at a pensions conference. Right. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I haven't died, I'm still <laughs> here. You know, so I think some colleagues who'd not had that experience or been in for so long or had been backbenchers throughout found it much tougher than they thought because you sort of, as an MP, you have a local importance and then as an ex-MP, as they say, there's nothing much more ex than an ex-MP. Mm. And, and 2017, was there any... No, oh, I forgot that, didn't I? Yeah. I've got out of the habit of nine some questions. Um, 2017, no, not really. I mean, so, you know, I had a new role. I worked for a mutual insurer, which kind of fits me, fits the culture that I kind of believe in. Um, we'd selected a, you know, I, I had the option in 2016 to sort of put myself back on the list, but I felt, you know, I had 18 years, fantastic privilege, wouldn't, wouldn't change it for the world. But I'd have been starting from scratch again, and not necessarily one, of course. It's very hard to hold down a job and be a spokesperson for a business in a sort of politically neutral way and then, you know, at weekends be hammering on doors and mm. criticising the government or whatever it is. So, you know, I've had my time, I think. I'm not sure politicians hate answering this, but would you rule out a return to frontline politics? Yes. You would completely? I would. I mean, you know, so I don't, I don't see myself in the House of Commons. I, I think that the Lib Dems have probably had their quota in the House of Lords till, you know, the next <laughs> millennium, I would imagine. So I think, unless something extraordinary happened, I think, like, yeah, I think I've, I've done my bit. And just finally, I've got to ask you I'm about this. I'm convinced you said finally in minutes ago. I know, <laughs> sorry, sorry. La last thing, if I may. Um, the, your, uh, the person who promoted you, Nick Clegg, uh, to your kind of a spokesperson position, has recently been knighted. Um, you, of course, are Sir Steve Webb. A lot of your colleagues, uh, Vince Cable, Sir Edward Davey, uh, have all been knighted as well. Um, there's a lot of kind of criticism recently that's come about the whole knighthood system, particularly when Nick Clegg uh, got his, his gong, as it's commonly known. Um, do you think there needs to be major reforms to that? And, and do you think politicians deserve knighthoods. <laughs> Just to end on I can't, a, uh, Yeah, I can't say no to that, having accepted one. Um, oh yeah, I think what was nice, you know, so when I received my knighthood, the bulk of people getting honours weren't people that you had heard of, they were people who'd done things in their community or excelled at something, and I think, I think at the very least, the balance of these awards absolutely should be in that direction, you know. Um, Certainly, I don't think gongs should be handed out. I don't think they should be bribes or sweeteners or consolation prizes. I mean, it's ridiculous to say that Nick Clegg shouldn't have got something mm. in a world where, you know, lots of retired cabinet ministers and people who never achieved that sort of high office did. So, you know, the, the vindictiveness towards Nick was just vindictiveness. I don't know, it was a good, you know, he's far more deserving than I am. Um, what was nice was that the citation for me was political and public service. So, um, yeah, I like to think that as well as being a part, you know, I was doing a lot for individuals, I've tried to do that since, and volunteering and that kind of stuff, but, you know, I mean, if it hadn't happened I wouldn't have been devastated, but it was, you know, it's nice when it happened and, you know, I was persuaded to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Well, so Steve Webb, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, thank you.